let's give it up one more time for Lauren. So we are going to get into our final performance, but I just want to say, um, everyone's performance has been so amazing, and I feel like every single person that performed had something that I related to or something that meant something to me. So personally, thank all of you, and then from AAF, thank all of you. And I feel like I can give this now because I've seen the next performer, and she's a fucking badass, so I'm real excited for it. So, L.S. Quinn is a writer, artist, performer, and activist. She is the founding director of The Reading Room, which is a nonprofit bookstore startup that funds after school programs for Cleveland students. Her work focuses on issues of identity and spirituality, often seen through the lens of domestic life and interpersonal relationships. Her feminist art and useful objects are available for sale at robotballerina.com, and tonight she'll be performing a few of her pieces for us. So let's give it up for Quinn. for that introduction and also for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be here today. I love the work the, Cre the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center does, although of course we all wish it were not necessary. It is. So I'll start for you with a poem tonight. I hate list poems. I typically don't write list poems. I have a vengeful fantasy about performing a set that's entirely list poems and like destroying the form of the list poem entirely through sarcasm, but I have not ever done that. Instead, I have written a list poem. Here you go. <laughs> Requests men have made of me. One, please reset my email password. Please set up my phone. Please fix my phone. It cannot update the operating system because I have filled it with extremely high resolution but low quality home pornographic movies. Please ignore the homemade porn. Please accept this bribe. I'm uncomfortable accepting help with technology from a woman so I need to give you a Danish to even the score even though you are a low-level public employee with celiac. Please file my taxes. No, I don't keep receipts or no, my IRS PIN. Please tell me you care about my opinions, well-being, and happiness. I have not researched these opinions, acted in my own best interest, or made any effort to create mutual happiness, but I'd like to know that you are invested. Please manage my shirt inventory. Please provide an accurate historical cultural exegesis of scripture that will not make me uncomfortable as a lapsed Catholic cishet white man. After all, Father Mike always did. Please take charge of planning, prepping, paying for and providing me with a low-sugar, diabetic-friendly diet. Note, as a man, I decline to educate myself about carbohydrates or glycemic indexes because those are lady things, so I will retain veto power over the menu planning, but I will not have any logical basis on which to provide input. After dinner, please wash the dishes, then please lick my diabetic butthole. I will then punch you in the face and call you a cunt. Sounds good? Please allow me to dictate the length and style of your hair. Grow it faster. Faster. I recognize that you have no actual control over this completely unconscious biological function, but I need you to verbally agree to this project anyway. Please allow me to bring scissors to bed with us. If you're a bad girl, I'm gonna take you to super cuts, okay? Please give me a 110 minute unreciprocated blowjob. Please depilate your body from the eyelashes down. Please ignore my fishy halitosis. Please roll over, I'll be fast. 
please make that special cake. It's so sweet and so good. Please vote for me. Abortion is a problem that we should solve. Please show up at nine on the dot. Please let me lead. I don't know this dance and I am shorter and smaller than you, but I am the man, so I should lead. Swing your partner, whoops. Please listen to my half-assed guitar playing. I know almost all of one Green Day song by heart pretty much. Please host and publicize my house concert. Please let me put things in your purse. It's so nice that you have a purse. Please do not ever ask me to hold your purse. Please let me drive. As you know, there are serious reproductive health consequences for men who ride as passengers, allowing women to drive an automobile. So I'm going to first get a parking ticket in Coventry that must be paid in person in Cleveland Heights, and then I will wreck your car, okay? Please pay this parking ticket in person in Cleveland Heights. Please pretend you don't know that I'm beating my wife. Please pretend you don't know that I'm raping my wife. Please pretend that you don't know how I'm treating my daughter, my secretary, and my favorite waitress. Please lose weight. Please lose the attitude. Please lose your friends and your job and your home and your faith and yourself and your name. Thank you. Was it good for you? So, um, I still think of myself as a poet that has become less and less true, or at least less and less exclusively true. I have become a prose writer and a fine artist and also a nonprofit entrepreneur. Please come to my benefit, please. Um, Yes, it is December 21st at the Book House. There'll be beer and books and weird gift baskets. Um, but anyway, while I was putting pieces together for this, I was like, wow, I don't have poems that I want to read for this, mostly. So here is an essay. It's always scary when people start reading essays in a notebook, because you don't know how long it is. It's worse when it's an iPad, because it could be infinite. So. If you will be patient, I'll read you an essay, and then a poem, and then a brief essay, and we will end with Christmas, which I think will be a good way to end. This is called Library Page. I am 15 years old. It's October, 1994. I'm wearing a flowered broomstick skirt, a nubbly woven tunic, and a black ribbon choker. Also, rebelliously, Birkenstock sandals and wool socks. My classmates and I have been fighting the administration for weeks over the new ban on open-toed shoes. It's snowing, and the school has been waiting us out, assuming we would eventually see sense. Fashion is not worth frostbite. But it's warm. The snow melts to gray-brown slush and mud on the sidewalks and tree lawns, and we don't care. We call a tree lawn a devil strip here, just south of Akron. We call our school Hoover, after the Hoover Company. Our parents still make vacuum cleaners. Maytag has not yet scooped up that prize and moved our jobs to Juarez. I have never heard of a payday loan. We cash our checks at the Neoclassical Savings and Loan in the town square next to the public library, the YMCA, and St. Paul's Catholic Church. I'm a page in the dim school library. There are no windows, and the lights are fluorescent, alternately greenish and purple. I check books in. I check books out. We still use stamps and cards. Sometimes I spend study hall chiseling date stickers off the hardbacks, but mostly I hand out 17 NYM. I asked the librarian to order sassy, but there was a blowjob joke in issue 10, thanks Christina, so she said no. 
She is stern and gray-haired with a very unfortunate bob, but she has a daughter. She must be human. She did understand the word beige. It wasn't in the dictionary, which is a huge oyster-colored book on a stand near the copier. The copier is miraculous. You can actually make a legible copy from a book because the hinge of the lid extends to fit even the dictionary. You do have to mash the spine down to get two pages at once, which is severely frowned upon. So when I make copies, I tediously open the book, flip it over, copy, flip, copy, flip, chunk it shut. I am allowed to make copies for other students for 10 cents a piece. They stand and wait, and the less desirable boys flirt with me. I never understand why the dullest and stupidest boys want to ask me out. It is baffling. It does not occur to me, not once, not for a second, that they are not exclusively interested in conversation. I know I'm a strange girl and cripplingly intelligent. I have just placed 14th in the National Spelling Bee and I will never live that down. But I have no idea that I'm also beautiful and that the combination is attractive to men and women alike. I myself have crushes on men and women alike. I am a sucker for skater boys bowl cuts and for the pixie on our school's only lesbian. Our school's only lesbian sits on the radiator in classical literature and argues philosophy and religion with me. She doesn't notice I'm flirting. Admittedly, I'm hoping no one else notices I'm flirting. It may be very subtle, very nerdy, flirting. But on Thursday nights, when her swim meets are coming up, I sit at home and angrily compliment, contemplate baking her a shoebox of cookies to wrap in foil and decorate with orange and black ribbon. This is how girls demonstrate affection, by baking cookies for their football playing boyfriends. I have never had a football playing boyfriend. A halfback asked me out, but I assumed he was joking, so I said no. I never bake those cookies. I do bake a cake for our Charles Dickens unit and decorate it for Miss Havisham's wedding. In that English class taught by another stern woman, I do not bother to take notes. I am shocked when we're told to turn them in at the end of the semester. I panic and I ask if I can copy Christopher's. She grudgingly agrees. Christopher grudgingly agrees. Chris loans me his notebook during lunch and I copy and flip, I copy and flip. In sixth period, the teacher's mouth drops open. She had not expected a sheaf of Xeroxes. It had not occurred to me to copy an entire semester's notes by hand. What would be the point? What is the point? I develop a deep depression, I debate suicide, I go to my morning job, the breakfast shift at McDonald's, and I try to slit my wrists in the break room. But the knife is dull, it hurts too much. I go to Kmart, I try to buy a hunting knife, but I don't have enough money. Instead, I go to school, and I pull my best friend out of class. Marnie tells me, I will never be alone. I am not the only person in the world who feels this way. This is comforting rather than frightening. She also tells me that death is my friend and will never leave me, will always be there, that suicide will always be an option, so there's no need to take it right now. This is also comforting rather than frightening. I can put off killing myself because I can always do it tomorrow or next week or next year. She saves my life. My life goes on. Often, in libraries, I learn to make files for the reference department. We own a huge machine that reads the new CD-ROMs. 
So we have an electronic encyclopedia, but for current events we read the newspaper, which is still on paper. The librarian marks certain articles in red pen and we cut them out with an X-Acto knife. She glues them to pieces of cardstock, color-coded by subject, and we file them in deep drawers by the dictionary. We have two copies of each newspaper, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. This way we can get both sides of an article. We can follow the jump. We slice and flip, slice and flip, then glue and flip again. Decades later, in the big city library where I am being paid to check books in and check books out, the branch clerk is going through the newspaper. I hear the page flip, and for a moment, she's cutting it with an X-Acto knife, ready to glue it to cardstock and put it in a file. But then my barcode scanner beeps and a receipt whirs out of the printer. Yendis Harper, an old man, unshaven, unwashed, has checked out eight Blu-rays, all horror. I know he is about to ask me out, and I will decline, referring to a boyfriend I no longer have. I don't have a girlfriend anymore either, but I do have an ex-wife. I have an ex-wife and a Tinder account, a college degree and a car. I wear pinup dresses and cashmere cardigans. I understand now why men ask me out. I wear lip stain and put my hair in a flip copying videos online. I help strangers send faxes, help them do their taxes. I feed children free lunches, sandwich, an apple, a pint of skim milk. We have an Xbox and a giant flat screen TV and an origami class. There's a payday loan store on the corner across from the school, the abortion clinic, and the New Hope House Prayer Holiness Temple of God all are welcome. I leaf through brochures from health fairs and GED classes, squaring them off and stacking them high. My life goes on in the library. Death may be a friend, but he's one I've lost touch with over the years. I had also lost touch with the football player and the school lesbian. I'd lost touch with the teachers and even my best friend, but now there's Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and we constantly gossip, we tell jokes, we share pictures of food. The football player tells me I'm the last woman who ever rejected him and he just assumed I was gay. We talk about the best way to fight this dystopian administration. We are determined not to just wait it out. Today, the snow is melting off the sidewalks and the devil strips, and I'm wearing open-toed shoes. Tomorrow will be sunny. We'll open the clerestory windows, let the light come streaming in over the shelves. Tomorrow, I'll judge a spelling bee and teach a man to use a mouse. I'll pause for a moment and listen to the branch clerk as she opens the newspaper, beginning to read and flip, read and flip, read and flip. Thank you. All right, so this is a sad poem. Um, but like I said, I still like to think of myself as a poet, and this poem has no title. I just titled it Sestina. The word Sestina means I went to college and paid money so people would teach me about formal poetry. This is the Sestina that resulted from me getting ABA. Uh, it is probably the most expensive piece of art I have ever made. It also involved payoff to my ex I wish I had known this earlier, the curves and corners of your body, the heat of your embrace, the sound of your breath, the sight of you arching beneath me, the silk of your skin. The scorching silk of your skin, if only I had known it earlier, had felt you arching beneath me, the missing curves and corners of your body, the absence of your sleeping breath, the loneliness of your lost embrace. I laid my head in your embrace, my hair on the silk of your skin, listening for your heartbeat, your breath. If I had listened harder earlier, could I still touch your body? Perhaps you would never have gone from me. 
If you had only not gone from me, if I could still return your embrace, if I could still line my curves around your body, feel the soft warmth of your skin, if we had discovered it earlier, I would always have loved you with every breath. Now I cannot breathe since you have gone away from me. I cry out evening and morning, late and early fire steals my breath, burning away the surface of my skin, destroying what's left of my body. If I had only known your body, if I had ever caught your breath, if I had ever lit your skin the way I cried out for you to touch me, to burn each other in our embrace, God, if we had only known this earlier, the way your body would burn me, the way we would breathe each other in, in our embrace, I would not be missing your skin if I had only known this earlier. Thank you. So, I promised we would end with Christmas, and we will end with Christmas. But a warning is that I am very ambitious and I am not very talented in the kitchen. So this is a nostalgic story about the kitchen. It's the Tuesday before Christmas and I'm alone in the house swearing at a turkey. It's been brining overnight because I'm damn well determined that it will taste good this year. My house smells like salt water, raw pork, turkey guts, and Lysol. It does not smell like the holidays. I don't want to do this. I want to give up. I want to just eat a lean cuisine and be done with it. But having bought the turkey for $74, cage-free, hormone-free, everything free, a turkey named Kenneth, I have to roast it. <laughs> No choice. And having seasoned the sausage for the stuffing, I have to cook it. Can't wait. That pork is on a deadline. As I wrestle the bird, legs flopping into the foil pan, it slips and lands on my apron. Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god. I get the thing onto the rack and switch aprons. Glad no one saw me. There is bleach in this apron's future. I fill the cavity with lemons, onions, and herbs and jam the rest of the fruit around the rim of the roaster. The turkey goes in the oven, the apron goes in the washer, and I go on the couch with a book and a glass of wine and a glass of wine and a glass of wine. One year, the turkey took nine and a half hours. God, not again, please, not that again. I am an atheist praying not nine and a half hours again for a dehydrated turkey. Three hours later, I've sauteed the sausage and scrubbed down the kitchen and the house smells better. Not like the holidays, but at least it smells good, kind of. It smells like cooked turkey and cooked pork instead of raw, which is an improvement. Not that the holidays really smell like something sold in stores, not like Peppermint Lane or Northwoods Pine, not Vanilla Snow or Holiday Stage, certainly not like Magical Frosted Forest. What is a Magical Frosted Forest? Holidays, to seven-year-old me, smell like Aunt Giovanna's house like roast turkey, next to stovetop stuffing, next to mashed potatoes, and extremely salty gravy. Like a family that thinks every vegetable's better with cream of mushroom soup. <laughs> like Grandma Quinn, a woman who never met a stick of butter she didn't like. The holidays smell like the years before anyone worried about cholesterol. They smell like love's baby soft on grandma's soft, wobbly arms, like ink on wrapping paper, like the Swedish plastic heads of new Barbies, like people smoking indoors, like beer, like diapers, and like a wet dog. And there's a slight, indefinable something in the air, a hint of something mysterious something only found in December, just as I walk through the door. As I shake the snow off my hood and hand my coat to Uncle Edward, as my cousins streak through the hall, hopped up on Coke and Star Wars, I smell that something. It's not sweet. It's not savory. It's not cloverleaf roll 
apples or cranberries or cider. It is something else. It is not pleasant, quite frankly. It is not pleasant at all. What is that smell? I find out on Wednesday when it's time for pie. I mix up the bread first, home baked with eggs, butter, sugar, rich yellow loaves. I start to smell Christmas, but Christmas isn't the bread. I cut butter into flour for pie crust. I mix the pumpkin pie filling and the smell grows stronger. It's fresh pumpkin. We picked it on the farm, we roasted it, stewed it, and mashed it ourselves, but the smell is not pumpkin. I shred sweet potatoes, I stew them, I puree. It's not the sweet potatoes, but it really is beginning to smell a lot like Christmas. Finally, the pecan pie. There's a pecan shortage this year and they are expensive. I called all over town looking for them and Patrick at the market said he'd look. No promises, but I'll look. He disappeared into the back for an hour while I browsed the magazines and then beckoned me into the secret storeroom behind the plastic curtain. Here, look what I have for you. He pulled back a sheet of tissue paper to reveal 50 pounds of fresh pecans. Fresh pecans. The smell was subtle and then stronger, rich and earthy like the windfalls we crack on the farm. Nothing like those pathetic baker's nuts in the sad little packets at Jewel. I bought two pounds. I'm making pie. I might make th two pies. I might make three pies. I might make four because I like pie. But the smell is not pecans. I hook up the food chopper. I'm not chopping two pounds of pecans by hand. I pour them in. The delicious smell of fresh pecans filling the air and I press chop. It's only the second button on the mixer. The motor goes whirr, clunk. I stop short. I press chop again, again, whirr, clunk, chop, whirr, clunk, chop, clunk, clink, 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 clink. And now, only now, in this perfect moment, does my kitchen smell like Christmas. Because Christmas smells like snow and cookies, and broccoli cheese casserole, and jello salad, and cigarettes, and a blender dying. Most of all, it smells like the electric fire I've started, like a blender dying. I have killed my blender, and I have made Christmas. I'm calling it a win. Thank you.